Menstruation comes with many myths. Period blood is dirty. Tampons are toxic. You can sink your cycle. The pill is evil. A lot of the birth, birth control disinformation is funded by right-wing groups. These are the people that want to take away your right to vote, your right to have an abortion. They have an investment in keeping women in poverty. Dr. Jen Gunter is a leading figure and myth buster in this space. You don't know if anyone's telling you the truth online. If your period stops because of these extreme diet changes, that's a medical condition called hypothalamic amenorrhea, which puts you at risk for osteoporosis. And she's sharing the science of what we do currently know about women's health and what we're still missing. There's a gross misunderstanding amongst society and physicians about like how painful periods should be. Women's pain and women's suffering has just been ignored. I'm Dr. Curran, an NHS surgeon, and in this podcast, we cut through the BS of modern health advice and tackle the biggest issues in science, health, and medicine. Women have historically been left out of a lot of clinical trials. The taboo and discomfort surrounding periods has also led to massive underreporting and limited interest from researchers. Three in four women experience PMS symptoms. Many have painful periods. One in 10 women have endometriosis. The list goes on. But how much do we actually know about female health and menstruation? And how big is our knowledge gap? Jen Gunter is an OBGYN, pain medicine physician, and champion for raising awareness about women's health. There is so much misinformation that's just been apparent since I've been on social media. I've been making videos on YouTube and online since 2012, and I've seen a spike in stuff more recently since the pandemic, since more people have been on short format, social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram Reels now, especially, and you know, you're an expert on obstetrics and gynecology and women's health. And especially in that field and in that niche, there also seems to be some pretty dangerous stuff online. And I'm thinking back to when I was a, you know, a young kid, I'm from India and I used to go and visit family in India on holidays. And I remember this one time we were visiting this temple in the South of India, me and my mom and my dad. And me and my dad went inside, we took our shoes off and we went to the temple and my mum was waiting outside and I wondered why she was waiting outside. And, you know, it turned out she was on her period and she couldn't go inside the temple. And I always thought that was very strange and I never really explored past that superficial stage. And then over the years, I was just interested why at every religious function, my mum sort of held back when she was in India held back from kind of joining the main, you know, function or religious festival, or religious rite that was happening. And digging deep into it, there's a lot of deep-seated cultural and religious undertones to this taboo around menstruation. And even in some parts of India, the women are secluded and isolated and living in mud huts. And I just found that so strange. In your opinion, in your practice, what do you think is the full consequence of those sort of taboos and stigma when it comes to menstruation? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, this idea that, you know, menstruation is dirty and toxic and women need to be sequestered is fairly cross-cultural. So, you know, we see, we see it in throughout history, we see it in many cultures and in many religions. So it's very unfortunate. It's very damaging. I mean, you're telling somebody that their basic biology is dirty. And in the scope of religion, you're telling them that they're less worthy of, mm. you know, the benefit of God or the gods. You're they're less worthy of achieving righteousness or holiness or, you know, whatever in the in the context of that religion is the important thing to attain. You know, it's a it's a very damaging message. So I think, you know, what's the impact on a young girl who that's what she sees her whole life, right? Her she sees her mother being excluded. Does that make you then think less of yourself as you grow up? Does it make you question less? Yes, it's a very effective weapon of control. And I guess you see that same thing, that dogma of, you know, blood is dirty or menstrual blood is dirty when you see these myths like women can't have sex on periods, for example. And, you know, there is some evidence that physiologically it may provide analgesic benefits, for example, if a woman does have intercourse on a period, for example. Yeah, I mean, there are so many different ways that this kind of myth can can end up harming people. And, you know, there's all these offshoots. So, for example, the idea that 
you know, having sex on your period is somehow dangerous to men. I always think, so who does that myth benefit? You know, the, the, does the myth benefit, you know, the woman or the man? It, it's been, obviously benefits the man to sort of, you know, say that your partner is dirty and, and has to conform to whatever timing that suits your needs. There was a paper, it was so awful, you know, some of the awful stuff that gets published, um, you know, that I found when I was writing my book, Blood, that actually was a group of a male physicians trying to explain, you know, their biological reason why they felt that avoiding sex when a woman was menstruating was important. And it was just so offensive. And, you know, I, I, I should pull that up and, and write something nasty about it. <laughs> why do you think there is such a lack of research historically? And even now, even though there's more awareness about women's health compared to, say, a few decades ago, why is there still a significant lack of research and still inequalities when it comes to trial recruitment, medical research, medical advancements for gynecological conditions in literature? You know, obviously a lot of it is, you know, historically, you know, it didn't interest the people who were in charge of medicine, or if it did, it didn't interest them very much. You also have to understand that, you know, hormones weren't discovered until, you know, the early 1900s. Hmm. But of course, you can say the same thing about thyroid hormone, right? But, you know, we seem to know a lot about that. So I think, you know, it's a combination of misogyny and not not having women in medicine to be representative to say, well, hey, you know what, I think that might be like an important subject. I mean, it's the same thing, you know, with all aspects of medicine, but OBGYN is, you know, I think the worst. So, you know, at least you learn when you only have men in trials, for example, about heart disease, at least you're learning something about heart disease, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it's not the best for women, but at least you're learning something. Whereas if you're not studying painful periods, then you're learning nothing about that subject. So that's also another thing. I'm sorry, that's my cat who <laughs> has this toy called Springy. And um, I guess she's found Springy. I don't know if you can hear her. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what that was. Um, so with regards to research, is there anything exciting, legitimate, evidence-based that's actually coming out in the field of women's health research that would be of interest, something that is actionable? Oh, yeah. I mean, so I would say, just as you mentioned earlier, that the last, you know, decade or so, we've seen a real swing. Things are definitely, you know, there's tons of papers coming out all the time with, you know, looking at different aspects of women's health care. And I would say that, you know, we've had quite a lot of good research for pregnancy health care. I mean, obviously, there can always be more, but it's also kind of a, an interesting statement that pregnancy was, was seemed to be the most, you know, we were caring more about women's lives as, you know, being pregnant than not being pregnant. Mm. So, but yeah, there's definitely, there's been a lot of great research and, you know, funding has to come. And I think as you, you know, you, we all know that without basic science research funding at a government level, then, you know, that tells universities that certain subjects aren't important. Then they don't recruit professors. That tells drug companies that those, those subjects aren't important. So this whole, Putting government money behind it is, I think, a really important thing. We just had a, a law passed in the U.S. very recently or a, a statement from President Biden that there was going to be this, you know, large amount of money shifted over to women's health. Mm. I think it's also important to mention there's one thing that never gets brought up in this conversation. And while I don't like to make excuses for the patriarchy, it is an important historical point. You know, when the thalidomide tragedy was realized, right, that basically halted all clinical trials of medications on women because mm. the whole fear was, when are we going to have the next thalidomide? You know, the, yeah. the, the concept that a drug could cause that much carnage, I don't think had ever occurred to people before. And that much carnage like that you see right away, things like DES, which is another drug that caused problems, that wasn't seen for, you know, years later. But so this kind of like, and it wasn't as physically apparent or, you know. So that really dropped all women out of clinical trials because it wasn't safe. Now, obviously, you and I know that intelligent researchers can absolutely find ways around that. There are, of course, women who are willing to not be sexually active. There are women who've had tubal ligations. There's women who partner with women, right? So, so there's all kinds of ways around that. And so I think it became a very easy out. And it's also cheaper for companies, right? If you don't have to worry about physiology, that changes all the time. So this thing that was done out of, you know, fear and, oh my gosh, we didn't realize this was a possibility, 
became, I think, a great excuse for the patriarchy. When it comes to a lot of research, you know, there's good and bad research. And, you know, in my uh, research days, my tutor always used to say, shit in, shit out. You know, if you put <laughs> rubbish in, you're still going to get rubbish out, whether it's a randomized controlled trial or a meta-analysis. I mean, if the initial data is awful, your outcomes and results will be awful as well. And you see a lot of research that a lot of podcasters and influencers cite that it's just maybe correlative evidence. And, you know, one of these myths that you hear about, you know, periods and women's health is this whole idea of menstrual cycle sinking. And there's even some yeah. evidence or not evidence or some letters published about that. Surely there's no physiological evidence to suggest that's even a plausible thing. Yeah. So you earlier you mentioned, you know, the impact of short form reels on disinformation. And I think mm. it's this kind of thing where that has it's all of a sudden become a thing all over again. And I I thought, oh, I thought <laughs> I thought we were done with this like 20 years ago. So yeah, there's absolutely no biological plausible explanation for cycle syncing at all. I mean, that's if you understand how the menstrual cycle works, you you would say, okay, well, that's not possible. No one ever says, well, you know, my horn hormones are going to, you know, I've got something in the ether that I'm going to send to you and affect your thyroid. Yeah. Why is it always reproductive hormones, right? So there's that. But this was actually studied. So there was a a clinical trial, not a clinical trial, it was a study published in the 80s that gave credence to the idea. That was kind of the first go around. And, you know, it wouldn't, I think, have passed further discussion nowadays. Standards were different, right? You know, when you go back and read old studies from, you know, the early, you know, the late 70s or early 80s, you think, oh, well, okay, things have changed a little bit. And and people looked at it, several groups of researchers, I think it's three different groups of researchers, right? So when one person says one thing and another person says another thing, you think, ooh, you know, whose methods are right? But then you've got one, two, three, and maybe there's more than that, but there's three that I can remember. So absolutely, and there's no physiologic basis. So it's, but it's... And the other thing I always tell people about this myth is it's actually quite patriarchal because it tells mm. you that, or the, the central position is that women don't have, you know, they can't control their own bodies. They need other, other women to control them. Like no one ever says that about men. So, I mean, I find it fascinating, like, you know, beyond those sort of simple myths like that. And then we get on to, you know, an overlapping myth between women's health and nutrition. And that seems to be a recurring theme that I see where holistic practitioners or functional practitioners claim that a certain change in the diet or a complete overhaul of some sort of diet or even a specific food group or specific food can actually in some way impart some change in blood flow, menstrual flow or something like that. And, you know, as someone who's a GI surgeon myself, I know that food certainly has a role to play in gut health and general lifestyle for sure. And we are increasing our understanding that food can have a role to play in the microbiome. But to go and say that a certain food or food group or type of nutrition can completely stop a period and change female hormones seems bizarre. But people still buy into this. And I wonder if it's just some sort of confirmation bias or anecdotal bias. They've done something and by coincidence, they've noticed a change in their period and they said, yes, this is the truth. You can do this. Well, I think, yes, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that if you look at the two of the the worst areas of misinformation or disinformation online, it would be reproductive health and nutrition. So you've got like this perfect <laughs> overlap, right? And food makes great videos and reels. And it's truthy. It sounds like it should be right. So that's yeah. part of the issue is truthy stuff is really sticky. So there's two points to this. So one is the menstrual cycle is actually quite irregular normally. So there's a seven-day swing cycle to cycle. So if normally you could your you could have a cycle that's 32 days and then a cycle that's 28 and a cycle that's 25 it could lead you to make false conclusions that your cycle is changing from what you're doing also we all have recall bias and we only remember the times that we that you know we get our confirmation and the times that we don't right i mean that's just human nature but the other thing i always say to people is just use common sense if there was a single food or a couple of foods or a specific diet that was supreme for the menstrual cycle, it would also be supreme for fertility. 
And so then we would see pregnancy rates different in the areas that ancestrally had that diet. And mm. we don't. Think about your the ancestral diet from where your family is from the, is going to be completely different to the ancestral diet from someone from Iceland, or my family is from the UK, or the ancestral diet of somebody from the UK. So think about those three diets, completely different. And yet, populations flourished. And so humans are incredible omnivores. Our whole system evolved to be able to live in extremes because in every one of these climates where humans have lived, there's extremes of cold, extremes of heat, extremes of flood. So you can't, there's not going to be, you know, acai berries all year round, <laughs> wherever you're from. If that's one of your foods, they're going to be there for three months and gone or two months, right? So all these natural foods that that grow in areas where humans have lived, they're, they're generally not there all year round. So, so you, you know, you think that, that food is seasonal. So of course we have to adapt. So this idea that there's a single food or a single diet that supports fertility in a way is, is really a bizarre conclusion when you think about how freaking adaptable humans have been. You know, you just think about all the things they've made alcohol from, you know, I mean, it's just in crazy. They'll humans will eat, and you know, we'll you know, we'll eat so many different things, and and thrive in so many different ways. So, do you think it's plausible that potentially these people who claim that certain diets can stop your period are essentially, for example, someone who's going raw vegan or carnivore or having some degree of restrictive diet is actually resulting in stress on the body and some, you know, range of vitamin and nutritional deficiencies. And that is causing some amenorrhea because of that stress on the body. And then they're accounting that to that food. Oh, absolutely. So it's a really important point and I'm glad you brought it up. Calorie, severe calorie deficiency will stop your menstruation. And it's more than the weight loss because they've actually done studies with bariatric surgery. And when you have bariatric surgery, your calories drop immediately. And, you know, the weight loss takes a, a you know, a little bit long, you know, you don't have, you don't, you're not losing 60 pounds in the first four weeks, right? Hmm. So what happens is there's a disruption in the menstrual cycle with very, very rapidly because of the severe calorie restriction if people aren't able to meet the calorie needs that they have. So yeah, so if you're someone who's going on some raw diet where you're getting 800 calories a day, your menstruation may stop quite quickly, but that is your body's response essentially to starvation. Because if you think about it historically, it wouldn't be very good to get pregnant when there's no food resources available because pregnancy is the most metabolically demanding thing a human can do, pregnancy and breastfeeding. You need to have nutrition. And, you know, same with, you know, these carnivore diets and other types of things. And also, I always say, you don't know if anyone's telling you the truth online. So there's also that. Yeah. But one other point I want to make is if your period stops because of these extreme diet changes, that's a medical condition called hypothalamic mm. amenorrhea, which puts you at risk for osteoporosis. And if you're 20 years old, this is when you're building your peak bone mass. So this kind of restrictive diet, um, which you know not only might affect the calcium you're intaking, but even worse, when you're not menstruating like that, you're not producing estrogen. So you don't have that important thing for building bone. So you may very well be increasing your risk dramatically for osteoporosis later in life. So it's that kind of severe calorie restriction or potentially even over-exercise, which I guess is why physiologically some elite professional athletes, women, female athletes might experience that hypothalamic amenorrhea because of a significantly lowered essential body fat content. So the you know lack of fat means a reduced estrogen production, presumably. Uh, and I guess any sort of stress on the body like that, overworking, overtraining, lack of sleep, calorie restriction is just basically plummeting your estrogen, similar to how I guess you would see in menopause, where you also experience that osteoporosis risk with a, you know, complete dumping of those, um, you know, estrogen and progesterone. Yeah. So it, with athletes, it actually has a name. It's called relative energy deficiency of sports or REDS. And we used to call it the female athletic triad. Um, apparently it can happen to men too, but I don't know anything about that. 
because I never read about that part. I always <laughs> I always ignore that part of the paper. Like I'm not I'm not interested. So yeah, absolutely. Relative energy deficiency of sports, and it's a real big issue because not only are there often calorie restrictions in certain sports, not all, but there is extreme putting out of energy. Right. So it's all an energy. Imp- it's an all energy balance. Right. You have your calories that you take in and your calories that you burn. So you have somebody burning this incredible amount of calorie and maybe not taking in enough. And so what happens? is while you don't have much fat and that might be part of it, the bigger issue is your ovaries literally shut down. Now it's Mm. reversible, but they stop producing estrogen. You stop having the signals from your brain. So, you know, thinking back to the menstrual cycle, it's hormones from your brain that trigger the, uh, the follicles and the ovaries to each cycle produce estrogen. So that trigger's gone. There's no message. So the follicles are just hanging out, not producing, you know, any significant amounts of estrogen. And the longer this goes on, the lower and lower the estrogen production gets to be. So yeah, it's significant. And then if you add the fact that there's this physical strain on the body, you know, you're risking yourself for stress fractures and then they may not heal. Mm. And so this is actually the reason why it's important to know if women are still menstruating when they're participating in high level athletics um, or, you know, have a way to, you know, figure out because you don't want to have that effect and then have these consequences later in life. So it's important. I mean, a lot of athletes don't know about it. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but, but some don't know, especially more at the junior level. And another issue is, of course, if you're an athlete and this is something that you know, you're looking for a sports scholarship or something like that, then, you know, then you're potentially risking your health, which, you know, we see in a lot of, you know, obviously it's, it wouldn't be just restricted to women and, and, and hypothalamic amenorrhea. I'm sure there's other ways that some athletes, some athletics have impact, negative impacts as well, or extreme ones. But yeah, so REDS, it's a real condition. And so seeing something like that glorified on social media is super harmful. Yeah, you know, I guess you mentioned all of those risks there, which a lot of people may not be aware of with the lack of bone density and increased risk of fractures. I guess having a period is a very energy intensive process for your body. So it's your body saying, hang on, I don't have enough calories. I'm just going to turn everything off. And I guess for some women who typically would expect it to have painful periods that they might think, wow, it's a blessing in disguise. I'm training more and I'm cutting my calories and I don't have a period anymore. But actually those insidious risks remain. And what I wanted to ask as well is, you know, about this premenstrual syndrome. And I guess there is this myth which perpetuates that it's all in your head or it's not a real thing. But, you know, there's still a significant proportion of women who experience at least one or more PMS type symptoms like irritability, fatigue, mood fluctuations. Um, so it is a real thing. And But what can be done about that, if anything? Yeah. So PMS, um, P- so there's PMS type symptoms. There's actual PMS, and then there's PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And just think about that like as a spectrum. Spectrum. So about 80% of women have like one or two symptoms that, you know, might be like a little bit bothersome, but are not a major quality of life impact. You know, bloating is a really common one, Uh, irritability, food cravings, wanting to have more chocolate, that type of thing. So, and yeah, and and in multiple studies, chocolate is actually one of the things that people crave. And I'm like, well, it feels, it tastes good. I mean, you know, like no one's going to be, oh, I really want to have more, you know, uh, carrots. I mean, it's not something most people say. Then there's PMS, which affects about 20% of the population or 10%, you know, depending on the study that you look at. And that's uh, where there's an impact perhaps on your quality of life and activities of daily living, but you can still go about your business, but boy, you wish it wasn't there, you know, kind of a bigger level of impact. And then there's PMDD, which is affects about, you know, 2% of the population. And that's got a far higher percentage of depressive type of symptoms. And so some women can have, you know, severe depression triggered, you know, each cycle. Some can have suicidal thoughts, uh, you know, so it's heavier on the depression aspect of things. And so to sort of think about it as a spectrum. Now, we don't actually know if it's a spectrum or there are three, you know, separate, you know, things because lots of different things can have similar symptoms. But, uh, but yeah, and there are treatments. So, you know, exercise can make some people feel better. You know, in medicine, I know we always say exercise helps most things and it really does. Um, exercise is great for depression. It's great for all those, you know, for lots of different things. Uh, figuring out what foods might 
trigger, you know, make, make your bowel feel worse, your bloating feel worse. So some people might feel better, you know, maybe following more of like a, a FODMAP type diet, you know, during their, you know, their luteal phase. And that's the thing with, with PMS, PMDD, and premenstrual symptoms, they can only occur after ovulation because they're related to production of progesterone. So if you have them like on day five of your cycle, that's not what it is. It's something else. So it's just important for people to know that it's only triggered by after ovulation. And then uh, antidepressants are actually really very effective for the depressive type symptoms. And you can even take them with ovulation. You don't have to take them the whole cycle. So you're just taking them when you need it. And the birth control pill that suppresses ovulation and keeps your hormone levels steady also can be very effective for uh, lots of different uh, symptoms as well. Not as much for the GI symptoms, but for some of the other symptoms, the irritability and um, feeling unwell and sleep disturbance. And it just depends on which one someone wants to try to see. And what the birth control pill does, because it's not just about the progesterone, it's like the change in level. So a lot of these menstrually related conditions are related to the change, mm. not the actual level. And so the birth control pill gives you a steady level each month. And you can take it in such a way so you don't have a period. So then you've eliminated all the hormonal fluctuations. So would you say that given such a large proportion of women have PMS, PMDD, or anything on that spectrum, and even PMS-like symptoms, that actually it is essentially a, a normal and expected part of menstruation? Well, I think and certainly in in our society, it's a, the premenstrual symptoms are very common, and they they're a very common part of the experience. What things were like ancestrally, we don't know, right? So we don't know if if it was like this ten thousand years ago. You know, we don't know how much of external pressures in society also amplify, and that doesn't mean it's in your head at all. It means that there's a strong mind body connection. Right. And so I think that, yeah, right now in our time in society, it absolutely is a very common occurrence. And I don't think we really understand why. I'm not sure there's been a lot of studies that look at different sort of cultural experiences with PMS. And one of the problems with researching it is in some cultures, women aren't allowed to express these kinds of symptoms, right? So if if it's not in your cultural language, that doesn't necessarily mean those symptoms don't exist. That could also be that those symptoms have, you've been told for millennia that those symptoms aren't important. So there's never been a language that developed to describe it. So it becomes mm -hmm. very, you know, complex to discuss. I mean, we know from, from some research from Japan, for example, that, that historically they don't have a good word for hot flashes in menopause. Interesting. Now, one explanation is, well, women in Japan don't have hot flashes, so they didn't need to develop a word. The other explanation is, well, no, they do, but the oppressive nature of patriarchal society meant that talking about your body in that way, expressing that was not allowed. And so you didn't develop the language. And it's interesting that once sort of the Western word hot flashes sort of entered into the lexicon that, you know, there's been more reporting. These are the difficult things for researchers to tease out is more reporting related to, to having the language. So now you can actually report the symptoms. So it gets very fascinating on a cultural level. And I would say that Certainly, and I think the the areas where PMS has been studied, it seems pretty similar across the board. So I would say that in places maybe where it's not discussed, maybe there just isn't hasn't been a space allowed for it. And that's one of the tricky parts of women's health research. If you've never allowed women to have those conversations, you don't, you don't really know. So I would say that yes, you know, that's a very long-winded way of answering your question and saying yes, I think that PMS, it, PMS type symptoms are a very universal experience. They're probably part of the normal uh, aspect of the menstrual cycle that, you know, PMS, uh, the way it impacts your quality of life is also unfortunately something that affects quite a lot of people. And PMDD is also less common, but affects a lot of people. It's interesting you mention about how society and culture and the societal norms shape our understanding and expectation of women's health. And I found this particularly when it comes to period pain. I remember when I was just starting out in surgery many years ago, I saw a young woman 
uh, with lower abdominal pain, uh, lower abdominal pelvic pain. And the family doctor had referred us this patient uh, with a diagnosis of suspected appendicitis. This patient's bloods were normal. Uh, we got an ultrasound scan of her tummy and pelvis. They were also normal. The patient had persistent pain. Um, and my boss, the consultant at the time, had said, you know, it's probably period-related pain, uh, you know, Mittelschmerz or something like that, you know, mid-cycle pain, and discharged the patient. Um, and the patient was still in pain when they were discharged. The patient represented a few days later with the exact same thing. Repeat bloods were done. Again, completely normal blood tests. A repeat ultrasound was done. In fact, this time a CT scan was done. Again, everything was just normal. But normal doesn't mean, as we both know, that everything's you know hunky-dory. And it wasn't until another consultant came along and said, you know what? She's had pain now for over a week. Let's just do a diagnostic laparoscopy to see what's going on. And they, we did a diagnostic laparoscopy and found significant endometriosis, you know, throughout just caking the pelvis uh, and the bowel as well, which is really just shocking to see uh, that this perfectly, you know, healthy young woman with, uh, you know, this chronic pain had had this. And that, and one thing in the history that no one really picked up on, and it just struck me thinking back to all those years ago, that she did mention that she had significantly painful periods. When this person had said she had painful periods, that was almost like a collective shrug with all the surgeons, like, okay, that's normal. You know, painful periods, okay, whatever, next. What about uh, your appetite, this and this? And it was almost neglected, and it was a systemic failure of the entire surgical team to actually acknowledge... At that time, that excessively painful periods, which are debilitating, are not normal. And actually, that should have been a cue for us to involve the gynecologist, involve, you know, other specialties to actually investigate, whoa, hang on, it's not anything surgical. It's actually gynecological, or at least could be. And do you think that that societal expectation that, yeah, periods are meant to be painful is harmful? And actually, is that the reason why we're not picking up in a faster, you know, period of time, things like endometriosis, things like fibroids and adenomyosis, all of these chronic gynecological conditions? Yeah, I mean, I think that, the, you know, we do a bad job in medicine, I think, with persistent pain conditions to begin with. And then you add how we treat women with pain, and then you add how we treat the menstrual cycle. So it's not really a shocker. I think that there's a gross misunderstanding amongst society and physicians about like how painful periods should be. And that if you're unable to walk around and do what you need to do after popping, you know, an ibuprofen, then, then your period pain is too painful. And, you know, you and I know that I don't get to decide what's too painful for you and you don't get to decide what's too painful for me. We just, you know, people are, use their own scales basically. And so there are lots of clues that can help us understand if we think this is regular painful periods or due to something else. So we call that primary dysmenorrhea or secondary dysmenorrhea when it's due to something else like endometriosis. And so one of the big clues is pain periods that have always been painful since the first period. That is a really big red flag for endometriosis versus okay, wow. painful periods that developed after several years. Because painful periods, like regular painful periods, are related to prostaglandins. They're completely prostaglandin-driven phenomenon. So if you don't ovulate, you don't actually get prostaglandins that menstrual cycle. Though the first year or two, your menstrual cycle is almost all anovulatory. So the bleeding is not related to withdrawal of progesterone. So it's rare to see serious pain in the first few years. And so if your period started at age 12 and you told me that your period started to get painful around age 16, I'd be like, Yep, that fits within the normal spec. Now you still could have endometriosis and it doesn't mean your pain doesn't need to be treated versus someone who says, I got my period at age 12 and they've been awful from the get-go. That's a much bigger red flag for endometriosis. But again, as we all know, people can present in all different kinds of ways. And the great thing about averages in medicine is they don't apply, you know, they, there's no like one average patient. So, but those are kind of the general stories that, that take you along. And then there's physical findings that increase your risk of, you know, thinking someone has endometriosis. But basically, if you have painful periods that are affecting your quality of life, and they're not controlled with a couple of different uh, medications, you know, appropriate trials of medications, then investigation for endometriosis 
use is absolutely warranted. And there are some people who are resistant to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, so that's always important to point out, that about 90% of people with primary dysmenorrhea, whether it's not due to endometriosis, just won't respond to NSAIDs, and we don't understand why. Then, um, you know, we can put people on birth control pills to stop them ovulating, so we can do things to take prostaglandins away. We can give you the hormone progest the progestins, which are the synthetic forms of progesterone that thins out the lining. There's less prostaglandin production, so we can work on it that way. But yeah, I would so I would tell people that if you've gone six to nine months with therapy for your painful periods and you have not made any progress, then it wouldn't matter how early it started, then that's the, the time to start considering endometriosis. And is that something that we need to do surgically, to look surgically? And some people just want to try more medications geared to endometriosis, you know, without surgery. And both are fine. You know, it's surgery can be helpful for lots of people, but lots of people can also have surgery and it not improve their pain. Because there's many things about endometriosis that we don't really understand. People can have severe disease like the patient that you described and have no symptoms. And people can have minor disease where we look and there's a few specks and they can have severe pain and there can be mm. all these permutations and combinations in between. And so we don't know if these people have two different diseases, right? Or if they have a spectrum of the disease. And I think a really good example is, you know, if I do an MRI on a hundred people, 90 of them are going to, 60 of them are going to have some problems with their back, but they don't have any pain. So, you know, there's you know, you have to link the physical presence of lesions with pain and we still don't understand, you know, is this a widespread inflammatory condition? And so some people have different genes that are triggering more inflammation, triggering more pain response. And so it's a less about the physical burden and more about what's kind of happening genetically, or is it something else? And this is one of the things that, you know, if you look at funding for endometriosis research and the impact it has on women, it's absolutely devastating. And the example I give is, you know, when I started medical school a long time ago, I was in the 1980s, the only thing we had for Crohn's disease was basically steroids, right? That's all you had. You had steroids. And you people were getting admitted all the time, and bowel resections, that, you know, people were like malnourished. It was terrible. And then because of investment in research, we now have all these biologics, right? We have all these other drugs. And you see people with inflammatory bowel disease living lives that that you couldn't yeah. have imagined in the 1980s and Crohn's disease affects you know significantly fewer people than endometriosis and you can see that same kind of devastation from endometriosis so the only example the only explanation for the societal investment in Crohn's disease and the the lack of the similar investment in endometriosis can be the fact that women's pain and women's suffering has just been ignored and it's interesting about endometriosis. I mean, given that one in 10 women, uh, you know, potentially suffer with endometriosis, that we still don't even have an underpinning as to what the etiology is. Like you mentioned, in part inflammatory, is there some autoimmune component? Clearly some potential genetic component. And I know there was, um, I think, a, 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 you know, I should caveat with saying a deeply flawed study, I think last year, a very small study, which suggested that maybe even a bacteria was involved or associated in some way uh, with that. I mean, you know, where is the research going with endometriosis and why are we so far away from understanding what is going on? Because you'd think that if you could actually understand what are the causative factors, we could then begin to develop treatments beyond just, okay, we're going to cut this out or we're going to just do, you know, this surgery and see if it helps the symptoms. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a real systematic issue. So first of all, you have a lack of appreciation amongst say researchers that this is a condition to study. You can't get grants. You have a condition that affects women. And so those those grants are probably less likely to get funded than um, than other grants. Then you have the way that medicine treats people who are in medicine. So if you look at a general surgeon and an OBGYN doing a laparoscopy, and this in the United States and in Canada, I don't know what it would be the same in the UK, but I'm sure it's probably similar. If you do the same laparoscopy, you'll get reimbursed less as an OBGYN. Wow. If I do a vulvar biopsy and a urologist does a scrotal biopsy, we both use the same punch tool, the same amount of anesthetic, and the tissues are homologous, the urologist gets paid more money. Interesting. So 
You look at the pipeline to how people get funding to do research. So in universities, right, I'm sure it's the same in the UK, or it might not be, but where I live, you have to pay for your own research time, right? So you, if you work five days a week at the at the, at the university and you're seeing patients, you have to see enough patients in whatever, four days, three days, two days, whatever it is to then pay for your other time. So you can work in a lab, so you can uh, do research. And it's a lot harder to pay for your time if you get paid less per procedure. So, you know, OBGYN also historically has been, you know, we've had to run from clinics to go to deliveries and go back. So the whole way everything has been run has made it very, very difficult uh, to have these kinds of, so how do you, how do you cover labor and delivery? How do you cover a full gynecology practice? And how do you also then devote time to research? These things become, it becomes harder and harder. You know, there's been less, I think, investment in, you know, in it at all different levels. And then if you add the fact that there's glass ceilings, even though most OBGYNs in the United States are women now, there still are, men are more likely to be chairs. Deans are more likely to be chairs. And these are the people who decide, like, what's the, what's important? How am I going to, if I'm the dean and I want to give a new researcher money to get them on the way, am I more likely to fund someone who's not studying women's health? Because, oh, how important are painful periods? So you look at all of those systematic things and you can understand why we're where we are. And, you know, tying in a lot of the things that we've spoken about, the disinformation, the the research and the inequalities in research. And we were just talking about the pill, the or conceptive pill or the birth control pill. I mean, over the last few years in social media, I've seen an increasing, I guess, vitriol and volatility towards the birth control pill and, you know, people demonizing it in such a way. And, and, and I understand in some senses that people don't want to necessarily put hormones in their body. And there may be, you know, some physicians who don't adequately explain the full gamut of risks of the birth control pill, etc. But clearly they have an important role to play in a woman's life. And I mean, even just looking at the research, and, I, and I, I've seen similarities between HRT, for example, and, you know, the risks of breast cancer or, uh, you know, blood clot risk with HRT in the research and also with the birth control pill. And you see the thing where people cling on to what they want to cling on to and they demonize the one thing that, you know, pops up in the research or in the abstract. Okay, the birth control pill increases the risk of breast cancer. But then they forget to mention all the other benefits of quality of life and improving pain, treating acne, lowering the risk of endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer. And it always seems to be that they literally emphasize the the relative risk, which is the big juicy number that they can say, it increases your breast cancer risk by this big percent. And they never then focus on the absolute risk, where it's actually a minuscule risk, where it's maybe one in several dozen thousands of patients might be at increased risk of a, a cancer or a blood clot if they're on this medication. What do you think that sort of, I guess, stigma and misinformation has on, you know, women choosing and deciding whether they should go on birth control or continue to be on birth control. Yeah, I mean, your point about people not understanding relative risk and absolute risk, are, you know, it's really, it's very salient. And I would also say that in the United States, a lot of the birth, birth control disinformation is funded by right-wing uh, groups. So it's ah. important for people to understand that. Um, these are the people that want to take away your right to vote, your right to have an abortion. Um, they they have an investment in keeping women in poverty. And the birth control pill, I think, is responsible for, in the United States, 40% of the, academic, of the um, financial gains women have had since the 1960s. So that's obviously threatening to people who, who you know, want to keep women from um, being, you know, in positions of power. So, yeah, if you look at the risk of breast cancer for someone under the age of 35, I, I'm, I may have the number off a little bit, but it's about like 1 in 50,000. Wow. So if you're increasing the risk by 30%, you're going from 1 in 50,000 to 1.3 in 50,000, right? <laughs> so that number, people hear that and they're like, what are you even talking about? No one ever, none of these anti-birth control pill crusaders ever discuss the carnage of pregnancy. If pregnancy were a drug, it would never get approved. 
It should would Multiple have the biggest, <laughs> yeah, biggest black box warning. I mean, oh, this this condition can give you fecal incontinence, right? This condition can give you urinary incontinence. This condition has a risk of giving you a blood clot of four to sixty in ten thousand, right? Wow. This condition can kill you. So people never have the full ethical conversation, especially on social media. And as we all know, Reels and TikTok is all about fear. Fear feeds that algorithm and you want, you're more likely to watch a video to the end if it frightens you than otherwise. So it's really frightening how good those algorithms are too. So I would say that, you know, there are, we can hold space for two things to be true, which, you know, social media is not good for. So one truth can be that women are not listened to in the office and that they come in with a medical condition, a medical condition that can actually be treated by the pill. And they don't get that medical condition explained to them and how the pill works for that condition. And so they think that they've been fobbed off with the pill. And rightly so. If no one explained it to you, then of course you think you've been fobbed off. And the pill can also be a fantastic treatment for many conditions. And it can also be true that we don't have enough research to look into other things, right? But one, one big example that I'll give is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So one of the most evidence-based treatments for it is the estrogen-containing birth control pill because the irregularity in the cycle is something that increases people's risk for endometrial cancer. It obviously causes all kinds of other issues. The hormonal disturbance at the level of the ovaries uh, increases androgen production for many women. And so the estrogen containing birth control pill can counteract that, uh, that increase in androgens that has all of those negative effects on the body. And the progestin will stop their risk of endometrial cancer. And so we see these predatory naturopaths and holistic, whoever, holistic nutritionists, and many physicians, I will add to boot, who then tell people, oh, well, there's a root cause of polycystic ovarian syndrome, and my diet slash supplement is what's going to help you ovulate. And the thing is, nobody understands what the root cause of polycystic ovarian syndrome is, and it's unlikely the single one. There's lots of theories and there's lots of things that are involved, uh, but there isn't a single root thing. And you know what? If there were, don't you think pharma would have been all over that? This condition affects 10% of people. If we had that knowledge of polycystic ovarian syndrome, pharma would be a way to the races, right? The, the problem is, is that we don't have a great medical understanding of the the actual etiology. We have lots of great hypotheses, but we don't know for sure. And again, it could be different for different women. There could actually be maybe four different types that have you know different causes. So you have someone who steps in and says, I'm going to give you my diet. I'm going to give you my supplement and I'm going to make you better. Hmm. And what happens is weight can make polycystic ovarian syndrome worse. It is not a cause. Absolutely. But people who carry more fat tend to have more symptoms. And if you're following a diet that also helps you lose weight as part of it, then you will see an improvement in your symptoms. And that might be falsely attributed to the acai berries in the diet or falsely attributed to the supplements that you're taking. Um, also, when you're taking advice from someone, maybe you're going out and exercising more and that can reduce your insulin resistance. So, and it's true that doctors don't talk enough about these things in the office. They don't talk about the benefits of exercise for insulin resistance. They don't talk about the fact that, yeah. you know, even a small amount of weight loss can be beneficial for those who are overweight. Now, there's all different kinds of treatments for PCOS and people do not have have to feel that they need to go on a diet, right? There are people who there have been so much marginalization. It's really important that we offer people treatment in a way that they feel that they can come in and they can be heard and a treatment that they can do. But it's so you, it's easy to see when, when medicine says, Ooh, it's like complex and doctors aren't explaining it. So when someone comes to me and I explain to them how the birth control pill works for polycystic ovarian syndrome, they're like, Oh my gosh, like I want that medication. But that's, you know, a big difference in someone saying, oh, here, take the pill. Yeah. And I, and I think a lot of this stems from this, you know, naturalistic fallacy where people believe that just because it's natural, it's safe. I mean, asbestos is natural. And just because it's synthetic, it must be bad. And we know that nowadays penicillin is synthetically manufactured, you know, in laboratories and factories. So this extends beyond just birth control pill because, you know, we can still 
women produce estrogen in their bodies and you know a excessively high level of estrogen can also have the same negative consequences and side effects as you know the birth control pill has and I think this extends even to recently I've heard more and more you know murmurings about this is you know the forever chemicals in tampons and how tampons are toxic um what do you what do you think about all of this well I think there has never been a good study that has shown that there are and that that there's consequences. So I would say that we have no safety signals in the literature from tampon use, right? Yeah. And there've actually been a couple of studies looking at menstrual product use and endometriosis. And endometriosis is actually a condition that we think might be possibly triggered by forever chemicals or be you have a relation to that. We don't know for sure, but there's kind of a hypothesis there or that it could be part of it for some people. Mm. There's no safety signal. Uh, you know, the forever chemicals in your water are the bigger issue. And I think that that's also important when people people get worked up about something that there's no safety signal for. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't study it. Of course we should. But the idea that this is something that people should be worried about is not borne by anything in the literature. And if forever chemicals are a big deal, you know what? There's the massive sources are not from that, right? Yeah. So do you wanna go to the source that's giving you 99% of the burden, or do you want to go to the source that's giving you less than 1% of the burden if you want to improve your quality of life, right? So I think it's important to understand that there isn't a way these chemicals are being added. Is it possible that the manufacturing process adds them? Sure. Someone needs to look at it. People don't get worked up about diapers, though, that tend to be made in exactly <laughs> the same way. Why aren't we worried about putting forever chemicals against the skin of babies? How come that doesn't become reels on TikToks? Or toilet because, paper, yeah. Right. Because scaring women about reproductive health makes copy, right? So I think that's a really, and that's a very sort of, you know, ingrained idea that, you know, if for, since the beginning of time, your worth has been valued as a breeder, you know, those messages are culturally important to us, whether we even ever care about being pregnant or not, you know, we, we're all products of the society that we live in. Right. So I think that we don't, we've never seen a reduction in fertility from people who use tampons. We've never seen, we don't see an increased risk of menstrual pain. In fact, one of the studies that looked at endometriosis found that tampon use was associated with a lower risk of endometriosis. Now, mm. I'm not telling you there's a cause and effect. There's actually <laughs> a great example. People who have painful periods are less likely to put a tampon in because it can be painful. Right. But so that's a great example about how. Just because you find an association doesn't mean that there's a cause and effect. So I would say that scaring women before you have quality research is no better than than not studying them because you're worried you have the next thalidomide and you're not bothering to follow mm. it through. You know, that's how I feel about it. And again, water supplies, huge issue. You know, people get all worked up. There was a big thing about a year ago, two years ago in the States about the period underwear and that they might have forever chemicals. Well, mm. if they do, they're bound on the underwear or they've been washed away. It's one of the two. They're not getting into your body. That's on all kinds of clothing. How come people are only concerned about period underwear? What about yoga pants that cover your whole legs, right? What about athletic wear? What about athletic underwear that men wear? What, what about that? Why, why does it only matter for women's vulvas, right? So those are the kind of things that I'm like, huh, why are you only interested in that? And again, it doesn't make sense that that would be a, you know, a significant issue considering all of the other ways that we're exposed to these chemicals, right? And I see this, uh, there's a huge uptick nowadays. It seems to be the new thing that everyone is jumping on, especially pseudoscientists and charlatans and people who want to sell things is around the topic of gut health and the microbiome. And naturally that then has its own, you know, spider webs, which spring off into different directions. And people then start to sell supplements, not just for gut health, but for the vaginal microbiome as well. And there's this whole, you know, seemingly fraudulent industry that's, you know, propped up overnight almost, it seems, although, you know, as I suspect it's been there for many years where people are selling probiotics for the vagina or they're selling some sort of you know feminine hygiene products and things which help you deodor deodorize inside or other sort of antiseptics for the insides i mean surely nothing should be inserted in that way or cleansed on the inside and our products shouldn't typically just be placed inside for you know hygiene purposes in that way well, hygiene, sex, 
you know, those are the, you know, those are two, you know, you, you, there's all kinds of fun sex toys and things like that to use too. So I would say that for um, the hygiene business, that is all based on a 100% lie, right? I'm complete misunderstanding of how the body works and study after study associates using so-called feminine hygiene products with negative health outcomes. So you don't want to use wipes. You don't want to use sprays. You don't want to use things that are meant to deodorize. You don't want to use scented products. All of those things are just garbage. So then when you look at probiotics, I would say that they're all garbage too. Uh, This is, I'm sure this is the same for gut health is that we don't know, we don't know about the microbiome. We are like adventurers who are are standing on the shore of a brave new world and we we do not speak the language. We do not understand what is going on. We don't understand the change in the seasons, the change that we, it's like a whole new world. It's like a stepping on a different planet. We don't understand like the vaginal microbiome. If I sample it in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, it's different. What does that mean? Having one, te- you know, and there's companies that sell tests for the microbiome, which are like, you know, the, we have no way to interpret them. I'm like, okay. And we have no way to replace it, and we don't even know what we should be replacing. What we do know is that disturbances in the microbiome, certain disturbances are associated with negative health. That's the best that we have. It's like learning a language, and you know, we know like 10 keywords. So you can like, you know, not die on the streets of Paris. You that like that's kind of what we know when it comes to the microbiome. We don't know everything else that we, we need to know about functioning in that language. So the idea that based on that limited knowledge, we can fix these complex medical conditions is absolutely absurd. There's actually been quite a lot of research in the vaginal microbiome, interestingly enough. And part of it is because disturbances in the microbiome are associated with transmission of HIV. Wow. So, you know, there's there has, there has been, you know, from the get-go, a pretty um, robust for you know, for this area of medicine, I would say interest in understanding the microbiome because, you know, there, there was, you know, a belief and there still is a belief that with a, you know, with a more robust microbiome, we could protect more women from HIV if they're exposed, right? Or gonorrhea, chlamydia. I don't think, I don't know if chlamydia has been associated with it, but gonorrhea has. And then of course, there's a condition called bacterial vaginosis, which impacts many women and it's a dysbiosis of the, of the vagina. But we have very little understanding, and part of this is because it's so freaking complex, right? Yeah. How do you study a moving target that you can't even really recreate the environment in a lab? You can do your best with modeling, you can do other things. And so we also don't know the negative ramifications of taking probiotics, right? So obviously if you're immunosuppressed, there are certain risks associated with it, but I don't know what's in your probiotic. like. Is it dirt that someone scooped from the backyard in the United States? It certainly could be. Uh, what are the consequences of taking, you know, these probiotics? I mean, for most of them, they don't contain enough to do anything anyway. And I think what a lot of consumers are unaware in the U.S. anyway that the labeling is often incorrect. So I would say that getting appropriate probiotic formulations to help people is an undiscovered area of medicine. There's people working on it, and we could certainly cause more harm than good by throwing things at it that we don't understand, especially things that are potentially contaminated. And it's hard to be on the leading edge of research. We all want um, to have all the science for us, but this is a situation where, I mean, my specialty is seeing people with chronic vaginal infections. That's what I do every single day. After I get off this, I'm going to go to the clinic and I'm going to see, you know, probably two thirds of my patients today will have disturbances of their vaginal microbiome. So it's a very easy population to target because we don't have a lot of good re- yeah. good treatments. We have a lot of research. We have good treatments. So you can see how people are so frustrated and they end up going in the other ways. But we need to wait for the science because we can we can often do more harm than good. And every single one, I, yeah, every single person I see probably or 80% will be on probiotics when they come to see me. And I'm like, you know, so my example I give people is when I first started in uh, medicine, you know, working as a clinician in the 1990s, probiotics weren't really a thing. And they really kind of started to become a big thing in the 2000s and then on to now. I still see the same volume of people with the problems, right, from before and after these things became commonplace. It's just now everybody who comes to see me is taking probiotics. And obviously, if you're coming to see me, you're not any better. I mean, you know, obviously, that's not like a research study, but to, just to give you an idea, you know, that we haven't seen any massive change. And we know, for example, for yeast infections, you know, probiotics probably have zero impact. Might they for bacterial vaginosis? Maybe. We need studies. 
I think similarly, I mean, the same thing is reflected in the world of gut health as well. There's a very narrow range of conditions for which there is some evidence, and even it's not very strong, you know, post-rectal cancer surgery, in infectious uh, diarrhea, post-antibiotics, various things like that. But it's an extremely narrow range of conditions. I'm not saying in the future that if we know more about the microbiome and how it influences and how it can interact with various other medications and autoimmune conditions and diseases, we won't in 20 years time have some sort of personalized treatment plan based on the microbiome that does remain in the realm of possibility. But certainly now this kind of degree of precision medicine with the microbiome doesn't exist. And I, I could totally agree. Whoever is trying to sell you probiotic or postbiotic or prebiotic related supplements to improve or cure some disease is likely, you know, straight out lying to you or, you know, significantly bending the truth and, you know, mixing some molecules of truth, you know, trying to sell something. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, no surprise that in those patients you've described with chronic vaginal dysbiosis who are desperate for something would reach to, you know, would clutch at straws and think like, you know what, it's not going to harm me. Let me just try it. So I guess that's where, you know, people are really exploiting the fears of, you know, those people. And, um, and I think, you know, I just want to say what you do online to debunk those myths, each and every one, your online blog, as well as your books as well, do a fantastic, basically public service to do all of that. And I've loved speaking to you today. So thank you so much, Dr. Jen Gunter. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. In the confusing and often impenetrable world of female health, hopefully you've come away with some useful information about the realities of what we do know and what you can stop worrying about. If you've got any thoughts, questions, or guest suggestions, drop me a comment below. In the next podcast episode, I'll be chatting to obesity expert, Dr. Andres Acosta, and I'll be speaking about all things Ozempic, why some people find it harder to stay slim, and how close we are to finding a real solution for excess weight gain. Subscribe so you don't miss that and the weekly Dr. Curran Explores podcast every Friday. Otherwise, I will see you naughty nuggets next week. Mm -hmm.